Welcome, I'm Keith St. Clair here at Grand Rapids Community College, and I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Joel Hondarp, the uh, Grand Rapids City Clerk. Thank you for being here. Well, it's Joel. great to be here. It's always good to talk about things that are happening down at the city and um, especially in the clerk's office. As you know, the, uh, there's been a lot of allegations of, of fraud in the last uh, 2020 election for president, and uh, I was hoping to address those mm -hmm. today. But I thought we'd first start off with uh, explaining your position, your responsibilities as city clerk, um, how, uh, how those perhaps overlap with the uh, county clerk and the secretary of state's office as far as the different responsibilities for overseeing elections, if you could clarify any of that. Sure. Um, what's interesting is Michigan is a home rule election state. There's only a couple states that have that. Wisconsin is another one. So in most states, um, the elections, the local elections, or I should say state and federal elections are run by the county clerk. So if you see in Ohio, Indiana, Florida, Texas, when they're talking about long lines and early voting and those kind of things, they're run by the county. So you're th you've got to think countywide. But in Michigan, it's actually about 1,500 some local clerks that run elections in their local municipality. Um, so we have 1,240 townships in the state, 500 some cities, and then 83 counties. So a very decentralized um, election system. So um, where we, well, we get our direction is from Michigan's election law. And uh, the Secretary of State is the chief election, election officer for the state of Michigan. And they have a whole Bureau of Elections that oversee training and, and the like. It's very specific laws that deter, determine that. Then the county clerks are responsible for acquiring some of the supplies, um, programming um, the election, so putting into um, the system and, and ordering the ballots, and they do that part of it, and they do the campaign finance part for local offices. So state does campaign finance for state and state office, statewide offices and any uh, offices that go across county lines, and then the county does campaign finance for county offices, local offices, and the like. The city and township clerks, um, administer the local elections. We hire the election workers, we test, um, we do a preliminary accuracy test, which we'll talk about later when we talk about fraud. Um, I'll let that one hang out there for a little bit. And then we also um, run the day-to-day -day operation for elections, um, registering, to, registering people to vote, maintaining the, the voter list um, and the qualified voter file, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too, what that is. And then also all the, um, put out all the absentee ballots, and, and then are responsible for all the tabulation of ballots as well. So a very decentralized system. So there's a lot of people that, are, that work in the, the system. So in Michigan, it's really, it's really, it really falls on the township clerks and the city clerks as far as doing the brunt That's correct. of the elections. Now, township clerks are elected. Yeah, so it's a little bit different. Um, city clerks are appointed. So, so before I was the Grand Rapids City Clerk, I was the Byron Township Clerk for about 18 years. And so that, that's an elected partisan office. So all, let's see what we said, 1,240, town, 1240 townships, so 6,500 election or um, elected township officials are up on the November ballot every four years on the presidential ballot. And they're elected partisan. So it's, it's a little bit different, whereas in the cities, um, and it's all based on the, on home rule. That's a whole, we could have a whole other topic on home rule cities mm -hmm. and how cities are designed. But um, in the Grand Rapids City Charter, um, the city clerk is technically elected, but by the city commission. So it's a very small election pool of, of <laughs> seven of seven voters. And some mm -hmm. city clerks are elected. So like the Lansing City Clerk, Detroit City Clerk are elected positions. Some are nonpartisan. Some are partisan. The Grand Rapids City Clerk is a nonpartisan. Okay. Um, selected position. Now how long have you been city clerk? Um, about three and a half years now, going on almost four years. So I started in 2018. Okay, but before the 2018 November election? Yes, correct. So I've, I've done um, three, uh, two cycles now. Okay. A state uh, gubernatorial cycle or, and a presidential cycle. And was there, um, uh, well, I, I got, imagine <laughs> there was pretty significant difference between the 2018 and the 2020 election because of yeah. the uh, COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic, but then also in, in 2018, um, Proposal 3 passed and really changed the landscape of how we do elections. Before 2018, um, you had, had to declare a reason why you wanted an absentee ballot. Um, whether it was um, you're going to be absent from the community, you're um, not able to go to the polls because you're sick, if you're over age 60, if you're in jail awaiting, um, if you're in jail awaiting um, sentencing, there's very specific reasons why you could get an absentee ballot. Now it's no reason absentee. 
And we actually saw that uptick actually in the municipal elections of 2019. We saw um, uptick in absentee ballots because you didn't have to have a reason. Any voter can get an absentee ballot after filling out an application. Mm. And the other part that changed was um, if you went to the Secretary of State's office to do something, they said, hey, do you want to register to vote? Or you had to be proactive to register to vote. Now there's automatic voter registration. So if you go to the Secretary of State's office to do a transaction, they're automatically going to register you to vote, and then you have to, if, then you can opt out. And some people do on religious reasons or various other reasons. You know, they declare themselves a self-sovereign or something like that. They don't want to be part of the election process. You have to be, you have to reactively say, "I don't want to be a voter." So that's changed um, the amount of people participating. And now those changes yeah. went in before the 2018 no, November after election? No, after the 2018 election. Okay. So that was approved in the 2018 election. So there's really a election. lot of variables that really would account for differences between the 2018 and 2020 there, election. There, the rule changes, the COVID pandemic, uh, that, all of that might uh, uh, skew the, the question I was going to ask next, mm -hmm. which was, um, what was the, what kind of fraud took place in 2018? versus what kind of fraud was uh, um, uh, realized in 2020 that well, is well, verifiable. That, okay, verifiable, okay. Cause yeah. it, cause Not the allegations. Yeah, correct, because in what, in what we find for um, what we call, so. I mean, I ask that so, question so, so, because it's, yeah. it's my understanding that there's always a handful of fraud sure, cases. Sure, correct. Is it there, or yeah, am I wrong so, on that? And, and so the, the asterisk always is fra enough fraud or whatever to change the results. Right. And where, where we see actual fraud cases are usually um, confusion by voters. Um, that it's a, it's a mistake that they've made. Um, so for, an, for example, um, for an absentee ballot, if, if you, um, you can get your ballot up to 45 days before the election. That's a long time. So you could have voted and returned it, and then on, you wake up on election morning, and, and I'm thinking of more senior citizens usually, and then you, you hear on the news, go out and vote, go out and vote, go out and vote. They're told, so they go to the polls, and a mistake is by, made by election worker, because we have in there that says they've already, we've already received their absentee ballot. But if an election worker misses that and lets the voter vote, they could vote twice. Where we see that um, is, is, is the most common place. Now we do. Ha there are some instances where, um, in in other places, they we don't see it widespread. It, these are very individual cases. So these are like like those would be honest mistakes, Correct. right? Those aren't nefarious plots. Correct. Uh, these are just people making an yep. honest mistake. They right. forgot that they had voted absentee, and they ended, they ended up showing yeah. up to vote. And the other person. thing we have is um, parents trying to help their their teen voters, the 18, 19 year olds and say, oh, the absentee ballot came here, they're off to school or whatever, I'll just fill it out for them and send it back in. So we, there's, been, there's, a, there's a couple cases of that was in Southeast Michigan. Um, we have it also um, where the, the Attorney General in the 2020 election has charged um, three different people. I don't know all the very specifics, but some of them are um, nursing home staff um, ass assisting their residents, mm. which, that is, which, is not, which is not allowed. Well, how, how do you catch those examples that you just mentioned? Um, a, lot of, a lot of times it has to do with when we do our signature checking, that the signatures do not match what we have on, on um, and that's where a lot of local clerks find that, is the signatures don't match. Okay. Um, and that's part of the, the safety mechanism we have. For the absentee ballots. For absentee ballots. Um, fraud in the precincts is really, really hard to do because we, we already have, you know, we talk about photo ID, in, in the state of Michigan, and we're like, we, you know, and there's a big push for photo ID, photo ID. We have photo ID in Michigan. We've had photo ID for a long, this is about 96. So we've had photo ID in the state of Michigan for a long time. What we, what we don't have, and what the, legislat the Republicans in the legislature is trying to do is um, right now, so if you go to the polling place and say, the po you know, the, say you live in the Garfield Park neighborhood and you vote at the Garfield Park gym, you go out for the walk in the morning and you didn't bring your wallet with you. You can still go in and vote, and you just fill out on the back side of the application you fill out. You, you just say, I swear, under um, penalty of perjury, this is who I am. You sign it up. Um, you sign that affidavit. You sign that affidavit. Saying that you forgot your ID. Correct. And, and it's just a handful of people that do that. I would say it's le statewide it was less than 1%. Okay. So, and so then when, those people that sign the affidavit, uh, there is there are they checked on to make sure that 
No, because 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 they're they are selling, but someone could challenge that voter, um, saying that's not them or that. Okay. So there there's there's ways to check it, and we do. If there are cases, then we can we can go back to those documents and we can check check that signature. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so so it, once again, a very very small, you know, over ninety nine percent of voters bring mm -hmm. their photo ID with them. So, so so when people are saying we need. We need photo ID laws in the state of Michigan. We already have it, and we've had it for years. What yeah. what the legislature and now there's a um, petition drive out there that says, if you don't have your photo ID with you, you can vote, but you're going to vote a provisional ballot, and then you have up to six days after the election to um, go to the clerk's office. You vote out. A, you'll do a provisional ballot, and then we'll click. So right now that is not in state law. I just want to make sure we're clear that is not in, in state law right now. That's a legislative. Proposal. Proposal. Okay. Now, uh, I can remember before, because I'm, I'm old, <laughs> I can remember before voter ID. Mm -hmm. And um, how, how essential was voter ID? I mean, was there much fraud before um, IDs were required? I mean... Depends on who you ask. <laughs> I, it, is it, was, it, um, was, was the fraud caught and prosecuted? Um, it's, unknown, it's an unknown. Um, because first of all, you have to have some you have to have some information. Mm -hmm. You can't just go in and say I want to vote in the precinct. You have to have a name and an address of someone mm -hmm. in that precinct. Was the fear then that people were coming in before voter ID was required mm -hmm. that people were coming in and giving the name and an address of somebody that they knew and voted for them? Right, and and so what would ha you know you would have to then have to. Hope that, that that person doesn't show up themselves. Because that's how they would get caught, right? Correct. I mean, if you were trying to perpetrate that fraud using someone else's name and address, right. as soon as that person actually showed up to vote, you'd be um, you'd right. be found out, right? So this isn't a primer on how to do this, right? <laughs> right. Okay, so let's make, <laughs> but, um, yeah, but that's one of the ways. And if you remember, if we go back, we didn't have um, in, in precinct voter files either, I mean, computer files. It was the green bar. We had the green bar paper, and you know the election workers would go through and look, th you know, look through the dot matrix printers, looking for your name. And cross off your cross name. off your name, and then it didn't have any other information. Now the information is we have we have a lot more information there. Um, we know in the database that, in the database that we mailed you an absentee ballot. We know that we either hadn't received it yet, or we have received your absentee ballot. Um, we also can get people to the right location too. Okay. So you're a supporter of voter ID laws. Then? I am. I think. I think. I think they work, but I think we have to. I think okay. the current system ha we have works because you're talking a very a very small minute that um, haven't and we haven't had any um, any fraud that I know of that has has mm -hmm. been because of that. And before voter ID laws, you would say that their elections were still legitimate. I would say they were legitimate, and um, and, and that's not. And that was not the case beforehand either, um, because we didn't have wholesale people going. Well, wait a minute! I showed up to vote, and someone already voted under my name. Hmm. Now you mentioned these signatures on the absentee ballots that are uh, verified. Now, do you verify every signature, or is it just, or do you just like do an audit of a certain number? No, we um, as we check them in. So the so the qualified voter file. Let's talk about that a minute, because that's kind of an interest. That's kind of like the first. Sure. First checkpoint. So the qualified voter file. So it's interesting. State of Michigan has had a statewide voter file um, since 1998. Before that, it was all every local clerk had their own database, and most states only had their didn't have their databases until um, after the 2000 election, um, because then there was federal money, and then they built their statewide uh, um, list. The reason why Michigan is so successful, we had um, motor voter laws back in, in the 70s mm -hmm. to allow um, DMVs to do voter registration, which was, a which was a big change too. Now Michigan is only of like one or two states that the Secretary of State is head of the DMV, or the Department of Motor Vehicles, and the, and the Bureau of Elections. So it was very easy for Michigan to um, talk freely between those two departments and build a list. And so we had, um, we had that list built in 1998, and it's and it keeps going through um, different iterations. Now, in other states, the DMV or the is is a department underneath the governor. Now, if you have a Republican governor and a Democratic Secretary of State, or vice versa, how easy do you think it is for cabinet members to 
work together to come up with a list. And so then Michigan didn't have to spend all the money to develop a list. We already developed, developed our list. Okay. So what's nice is, um, so let's say you live in uh, Byron Township and you, live, and you, and you um, move into City of Grand Rapids, you can go online, change your voter registration. It's all within the department. Of, it's all inside that qualified voter file. And it's, it's, it's statewide. Okay. Which it, which is great. It's all it's all web based. So it's web based for us. So um, I can. Go, it's it's secured. It's um, we have a multifaceted um, security. So if I go into the qualified voter file under my ID, I have to go to my phone and, and put in a six. I have to get a six digit code and put it in there. So it's it's a very secure system. Mm-hmm. Nobody can get on the system unless they have. Um, multi-factor um, authentication, which, which is good. So, so this, the system's secured and we wanna make sure it's secured. So going back to the signature question, so your signature that you have on your driver's license, that's what we're matching. Okay. Um, now, when you sign official documents, you probably sign it differently than how you sign your credit card receipt. You know how we all do our the, like a line, or we do it quickly. Oh, that's true. So, yeah, so, I guess I am guilty of that. Yeah. So I, you know, and, and I don't think credit card companies are checking your signature on every transaction. But we do ch- check that, and we're checking it against your driver's license. So, it, so that's kind of how you want to make sure you're signing your um, absentee stuff to match to match that signature. So when we go to so when your absentee ballot or your absentee application comes to the clerk's office. We scan it in, and your and your signature pops up. Now, not everybody has their digital signature on file, but we have we have a, a voter card of every voter in the city of Grand Rapids. So we have a master card. So we have this huge filing cabinet that's filled with everybody's cards. So we can go check those cards. So you know, say um, someone who registered to vote back in the uh, 1930s doesn't have a driver's license anymore, or never got a driver's license, but we, when they register to vote, we capture their signature somewhere along the way. Wow, that's, so that's we can, really so, kind so, of so amazingly high it. tech then. It is, and that's, and that's part of that security and that safety that we have, is we have paper stuff to back up um, what we do. Hmm. Now these, these voter IDs, right, it would be mm-hmm. like a driver's license yep. or a state ID that you can yeah, get, so we, correct? Yeah, so, we, there's, so, it's a, so let's not talk voter ID, let's talk photo ID. Because we don't have a really a voter ID, some state, some countries and states have actual voter IDs. Mm-hmm. So we use photo ID. So it gets a little confusing sometimes because we, but, but we want to make sure that we check for a photo ID. So it's either a um, Michigan driver's license or um, state issued ID, um, but it doesn't have to be current, because you know, you know, hundred year old. Um, person doesn't drive, may not drive anymore, right. they have their driver's license from 20 years ago, they can still use it. They can the, still use they it. They can still use that. Okay. You can use a driver's license from another state, but that has to be current. Okay. You can use a pa- current passport. Um, students can use their GRCC um, photo ID. Okay. Um, Michigan State, um, Catholic Central, any kind of student ID that has a photo. Okay. So as, long it's, as, it's by, little... as long as it's by an accredited um, institution. So it's a little different than some other states. Then, Correct. Because uh, you know you, you, some of the backlash against that was that uh, people were accusing it of being like a, a new poll tax because you'd have to pay to get a state ID. Right. Or you'd have to pay no, so, to get a driver's no, license. No, so it's 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 a list of like seven or eight. Um, tribal ID is another one, and then like a military ID. Okay, so it doesn't really have to be one of the two driver's license or no. fo- um, state ID. Correct. So we're not checking your address on your photo ID. We're checking your photo and your name. Okay. You're putting your voter registration because because you might not have you might not have updated your address or or the like. Mm-hmm. So it, it, that makes it difficult for anyone to argue that uh, this is the equivalent of a poll tax by having correct uh, and, and, and at I, least in Michigan. Well, and I, and I believe if 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 you have indigent um, circumstances, if you're not able to afford one, you can go through and get a photo ID as well. Okay. I think if you if you um, if you need help getting it, I think the state does that for you too. And the Michigan legislature said, okay, we'll also put funding in there as well um, for, for state IDs as well. Okay. Now, do you have any stats or anything on the, I mean, even if it was an honest mistake uh, in 2018, or the number of uh, cases in Grand Rapids that, that qualified as being um, um, 
I don't know, irregular, what, what term would you use? Uh, it could you be say fraudulent? Is that well, it could be, term? but a lot of it's sometimes unintentional. I'd say like two or three out of... In 2018? Yeah, out of, out of thousands. Okay, did that uh, vary in 2020? No, it was, it was, about, it was about the same. About actually, where, actually, where we see it actually more is in municipal or like special elections, just because people aren't as in tune and so they, um, we we saw it actually a, a, a couple cases of that in in 2000 um, in the 2020 August um, special GRPS or Grand Rapids Public School millage is um, and people just get their email they get those ballots so soon and they get so so what I do is so what we do as clerks is we want to make sure we don't have those issues so we're mm -hmm. we're going to make sure when we do the um, biannual training so. So another part of our fraud prevention, so we had lists, right? Clean up, make sure our lists are clean, and it's a statewide voter list, so you're not on like list at, in Kent County and list in Ottawa County and list in that, it's a statewide list. Mm. And it's based on your driver's license. The second, the second part of um, security is training. So we, we have to, our election workers have to go through training every two years. Um, so one of the things that we're going to highlight, obviously, is making sure that um, because absentee ballots are so much higher now, making sure that we're verifying that if someone automatic di didn't get their absentee ballot returned to us, because that's going to be a, a big training point. And uh, in order to run elections in Michigan, I need to be accredited by the state as well. So I had to go through it way back, way back when I had to go through a two-day class put on by the Bureau of Elections, and annually I have to go through. Um, accreditation or reaccreditation not the full thing but they mm -hmm. give us um, continuing education so all the clerks have to do that so and if they don't the secretary of state has the ability to remove our, our election duties from us and that happened to a township in Hillsdale um, County this year so the, it was a new clerk who got elected in 2020 did her accreditation but she didn't allow her equipment and that's kind of that whole um, talk about fraud we maybe we'll delve down that road about our voting equipment, but she re refused the vendor to do updates on the election equipment, which is which we have to do based on on the state. The Secretary of State removed her, um, and she didn't do the accuracy test. She was so the Secretary of State removed her ability to to run election in um, in August and gave it or in November of this year and allowed the county clerk to run the election for that township. So that's the Secretary of State has that. So if we don't do accreditation and not do our continuing education. The Secretary of State has the ability to remove our um, our election duties and either give it to the county or to another um, jurisdiction. Mm. You mentioned the word vendor. Who are you referring to there? Um, depends on. So there's three um, um, election vendors in the state of Michigan. So we have Dominion, which has been a lot of talk. Um, then there's ESNS Election Systems Software, um, which a handful of counties do. And then there's Hart. Okay. So, so Kent County uses Dominion voting systems. Um, Ottawa County uses Hart. Um, when you go to Southeast Michigan, all three big counties each use a se separate system. Okay. So Macomb, are... Macomb uses ESNS. Oakland County uses Hart, and Wayne County uses Dominion. And these vendor companies that you're referring yep. to, they provide both the software and the hardware. Yes. Yeah, so they provide the software and the hardware, um, and and it's not like you can just go to Best Buy and buy right. and, and buy this. Um, it's obviously proprietary software. All three companies have been in the business for a long time. And in order to get it to, we'll say to market. They need to go through to the Election Assistant Commission in DC, and it has to get approved there. And then it had to go through a huge vetting process through the state of Michigan, um, Department of State. And we also did a lot of um, local clerks, you know, kicking the tires on them to, to see how it works for us. So um, it, you, can't just, you can't just get to the market and say, here's my new voting system. Right. It has to go through various different levels of, of approval. And these are the machines that I, when I go in to vote here in, yep. in, in Grand Rapids, I, I, I fill out my ballot and yep. I slide it in that machine. That's correct. That's the, that would be one of the machines you're talking C about, correct. right? Correct. So, yeah, so it is a, so, um, it is a tabulator, and what it does is okay. it counts votes. That's, it, that's its job. Okay. Now, is that machine connected to the Internet at all? No. Um, okay. the, let me put an asterisk. The only time that it's connected to anything is at the end of the night after we close the polls, we, we hook up a modem to it, a 3G modem, and it distributes the, the results from that tabulator to um, the system. However, we're going away from modems, so we won't have to worry about that in the future. Well, what are you uh, going to? Yeah, so, so we're going to have to like upload, after the end of the night, we'll upload the data from, from the flashcards. 
and then that's how the information will get to the, the county clerk. Uh, so, 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 for, so, as, so for the programming, the county clerk, uh, the county clerk's office, they program the election on a computer that is not hooked up to the internet. Right. It's a separate standalone computer, and the program is, is um, downloaded onto flash drives. And we in the county, I, for sure, for Kent County, they wipe those flash drives after every election. They're 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 cleaned, so they go through a special cleaning okay. process to clean. They load that, okay. and then we. So when you said flash card earlier, you were no, talking about the flash drive. Nope, two different things. Ooh. So I'll get there. So we have the we have flash drives where that program is on. Um, Kent County programs all the flash cards that go into the tabulator. There's two. Think of your compact flash card that goes in t inside of a camera. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's there's there's a primary one and then there's a backup. And then once that program is in there, it gets sealed by a, a seal with a seal number on it, so we can see if it's tampered. Um, we don't do padlocks mm -hmm. on anything. Padlocks are not secure because there's no numbers. There's, I mean, I can unlock it and lock it all day if I have a key. Yeah. So we use actual seals that pull, pull tightly and they have numbers on them. And we record those seal numbers on a pull book and so they can get matched all the way through the system. That's part, that's part of that security. Mm -hmm. um, so Kent County programs all those flash cards for all the county except for City of Grand Rapids because um, we have 76 precincts. So us alone is almost the same size as the whole rest of Kent County. So we have a, also have a workstation of taking, so I can take, so I get that flash drive, I load it into a computer that is not attached to the internet, and then I can, then I, my staff and I, we program the cards and do all that. Um, Makes me wonder how they did in the old days before, you know, all these computers, did they just phone it in and say, hey, our results in this uh, well, precinct well, are they would. 500? Well, and it used to be, you know, hand tallied, or you had the big voting machines where you, you know, I don't know, are you that old? <laughs> where where you you flip the switch. Flip the switch, and yeah, you pick all I, your things, and then I you had, and you could chunk it, and yeah, um, pull the big lever. Right, and so and then you would take that whatever that information is off the back. I think it was off the back of the machine, and then you would give those results. And then we moved. We went well, really, that you know those days sound even less secure. I, well, it is. Right. And, I mean, well, see, you, could, you would think we our, our, our elections may be more secure now with this technology that you're talking it, it about is. versus and the old technology. There is. Uh, well, in the, probably the. Then we had, you know, and if you didn't have those, and there's some there's some areas that still even for local elections, I don't know in the state of Michigan anymore, would do paper ballots. Um, I worked I worked an election once where I um, worked as a challenger in a precinct in Sterling Heights, and it was a, for a special state senate race years ago, and they did paper ballots, so they would hand count them at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know after the the machines, then we really got high tech, and we went to punch cards. And um, I remember p punch cards were big for elections and, and, and universities. <laughs> you know the, the, the punch cards, and yeah, if, if remember it was the 2000 election with the, the and, and the guy, you know that you know, what and a that, disaster it, those punch cards were then. Correct. And so, um, was it dimpled? Was it pushed through? Was it? Um, yeah, because the, the the little you'd have a stylus that you'd punch the punch card correct. through a hole. And hoping that the, yep. the little chad would detach right. completely, but often it didn't detach, and sometimes it flopped back into place when it went C through the correct. machine. Correct. So, so for a recount, it was it was really hard. And that created all the problems in the 2000 election. Right. So, so the next so the next iteration of voting was optical scan, and that's where um, Michigan ha had. So, so Michigan had a combination of punch cards, and then like Plainfield Township, just north of us here, um, they actually went to um, a digital recording elections, those were allowed. So a DRE, so you touch your screen, and it would, so think of like the old voting machines, you would put in your results, and a lot of states had this, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars around the country putting in this, because that was the high tech, was you would put in your stuff and then it would go to a central card or whatever, but there's no, how do you do a recount? Yeah. There's no paper. But Michigan never did that. Well, a few communities did. So, did like they? like Plainfield Township, they invested a bunch of money in these DREs, and then the state said, um, after 2000, we got to have some kind of paper. Right. And so, we're, so Michigan became an optical scan state, and that's basically reading ovals or completing arrows or filling in boxes depends on the the software. Mm -hmm. um, so when when Kent County area first got um, optical scan, we we completed a little arrow. It was an arrow, and you kind of filled in. And now we have ovals. We yeah. fill in ovals. So I mean, people. Um, so we need paper. So 
So security number three is, is paper, is because we can recount paper. Okay. Um, so if the tabular says there was 100 votes for, jo for John Smith, and I count 100 votes for John Smith, we're recounted. Okay, so not only do we have these machines yep. and the, the count that they tabulate, but we also have the paper ballots that went in in the machines, and those are kept in case they never ever need to be audited C correct. compared to the numbers of those paper ballots with the ones that went in, the numbers correct. that the machines have. Yeah, and then for, fe and so for, for federal offices, we have to keep those ballots for 22 months. So I, I have all the 2020 ballots, they're all still secured um, until, until um, September of 2022, and then they can be shredded. Yeah, so I mean, um, and then the idea that uh, Russians could somehow hack in and change the numbers in our voting machines, it would, it would be caught because we'd have a paper count That's correct. that we could verify against any machine that was quote unquote tampered That's with. That's correct. And, and, and once it certainly again, couldn't be tampered with via the internet because right. it's not hooked up to the it's internet. It's not. So until. actual results and stuff can't be tampered with. I think what some of the allegations was is Russian tampering with the campaigning and various other things. So that's a whole another thing of, so elections and campaigning are two separate things. I'm on the election part of it. It's up to the candidates and everybody else to do campaigning. That's all internet based right. between um, in it, information, misinformation, disinformation. Information for you might be misinformation. I would declare information or misinformation. We right. all have a, I mean, that's very subjective. My work is hopefully very objective. I like to use the analogy of you're, you're more the referee, yes. and if uh, the players be in the political parties yep. and they're during the campaign, if they want to deflate the football, uh, you're probably not going to catch that, but uh, you're going to make sure that the game is played fair. I'm, I'm going to make sure that every voter, I should say, every citizen that is eligible to vote has the opportunity to vote and vote a safe, secure ballot. And the that's, scoreboard is not being tampered with. That's correct. And, that, and that's, and that's the, the best way we can do it. So another way that we can, so security number four is um, we do a pre-election pre accuracy test. So we want to make sure that the tabulator does what it's supposed to do. And so we have, um, so we go through and we test every single tabulator that we're going to use in the precinct with a predetermined chart of results. So we're going to make sure that every position on that ballot um, at least has one vote. And we're going to make sure that every position, so let's say there's you know, 10 candidates for president, we're going to make sure that every candidate on there has a different count. So, um, so 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So we're going to make sure they all have different counts because we want to make sure that it's tabulating process. We don't know what counts a ballot, but we want to make sure that it's tabulating pro pro um, properly as well. And you do this every election? Every election. Holy cow! So, so, you, so you basically, do a, a practice election. We do. We do. So we have, um, so we have to fill out all those ballots to um, make sure the test, and then we have to make sure we zero it out afterwards to make sure that it's there's zero votes on that tabulator on on election day. So, for these machines, it's none, none of them is their first rodeo. No, they've they've gone they've gone through lots of testing, and so for example, um, so if you take like a the Grand Rapids Public School millage election we had just this last August. It's just a yes, no question. It was like seven ballots. Because we, we fill in all the positions, and that, of course that ballot's not gonna count because it's an overvote. Mm -hmm. And then we, we do a blank ballot, because somebody might not wanna vote for any of them. They wanna prove that they voted, I voted, but they might not wanna vote for anybody. So you can vote a blank ballot, it just won't count any positions because you, you voted a blank ballot. Yeah, I don't um, think a lot of people know that. And you, it, you could go in and vote for just one office and leave the rest of the ballot blank. That's correct. And your vote for that one office still counts. That's correct. And I so think, we, I don't it, think a lot of people are aware of that. What we need to get people to do is fill out their whole oval. We have a lot of people that can't fill out, that don't fill out their full oval. So my <laughs> takeaway is fill out your ovals. <laughs> um, but Instead so, of circling it. Correct. So, so we test it. So what gets really big test decks, so I said seven for like a yes, just a simple yes, no question. For the March um, presidential primary, where we had lots of candidates on the Democratic side, the same thing happened in 2016 on the Republican side. When you have 14 candidates that are running, so you need 14, 13, 12. So it's like, it was like 110 ballots 
for each tabulator. And you'll feed them in one at a time. For your stress test? For the stress, yep. And then, so, so that's the, so, for, so we do a preliminary action test on all, that's staff, that's staff done before the election. And we have to print out all the, t so all that's there for, so anybody can see it. And then we have a public accuracy test. So we put it in the Grand Rapids Press, saying that we're gonna have this public accuracy test. It's run by the City Election Commission. So we have three members of the City Election Commission, which is myself, the city attorney, and this, the assessor. And we're the ones who um, officially appoint election workers and we do the public accuracy test. And I'll let you guess how many people come to this public accuracy test. Oh, I, I have no idea. I, let me tell you, I don't need rope and stanchion. I don't need megaphones or micro, uh, um, for the November 2020 election, we had zero people come to the public accuracy test. So if everybody's concerned about security, now, when we- And they were welcome to come. They were welcome to come. In August, we did have, we did have a person come in the, the August 2020 primary. I think we had somebody at the March, but no one came for the November 2020 election. Oh, and when does uh, this take place? It's, it usually takes place a couple weeks before the election. Um, but it, there's a notice in the Grand Press Press. Now, we can, we can go the, whether people are getting the Grand Press Press or not anymore. If that's a whole other topic. Um, but we also publish that when, when we're having it. And the, actually, the Kent County Clerk's Office, so um, um, Lisa Postumus Lyons, who's the county clerk, has really gone above and beyond as the county clerk. So they have a website called Kent, Kent County Votes. If you go on there, she posts all the local um, when the, all the locals are going to be having their accuracy test. That's not that's not in her statutory duties that she has to do that. But she's really going above and beyond to be transparent. The accuracy tests that take place before the actual yep, election. Yep, correct. So if you wanted to go see Grand Rapids and Cascade and how we all do it, so so all the state law says we have to we only have to public do a public accuracy test of one of the tabulators. Mm -hmm. And so Grand Rapids we do three of them because we have three wards. So we do one for each ward. So if someone is really concerned about that sort of thing, they would come to that meeting before yep. before the actual election, right? Uh, rather than waiting to find out if their candidate lost right. and, then, and then questioning right. it. So that's so that's accurate. So that's our fourth one, and then so that's the pre-test. Then after the election, we obviously go through the we you know when you see obviously um, you know this, but others might not know when you see the, your results on CNN or Channel Eight News or Channel Thirteen News at the at night, those are unofficial results. Those are those those are just numbers that they're getting from the tabulators. Now there's a whole bunch of other things that go behind the scenes. Then we have a, a county canvas. Mm -hmm. So the board of county canvassers, which this, the 2020 election, once again, is no one knew this whole canvas problem. Everybody knew who the Michigan Board of Canvassers were, the county board of canvassers, no one, especially in Wayne County and the Michigan one. No one knew who these folks were. No one paid attention to them. I mean, all of a sudden, around the country, people are paying more attention to canvassing boards. And so they can go through and if there are any errors or um, they, can, they can go through and, and canvass election. Once they do their work, that's official votes. Okay. Now, when and how long after the election? They, they start on, so if election's on Tuesday, they start Thursday morning. Okay. And Kent County, I think, canvassing board, they went for like 10, I think they have 10 days to do their work. Mm -hmm. Because then all those 83 county canvassing boards go to the state canvassing board, and then they have to certify the election. So just because election day is on November 3 or November 8 coming up, there's a whole another three weeks, four weeks of stuff. They just have to have their work done before in a presidential election before the legislature or to the, board, to the electors have to sit down and actually vote for president. Because mm. remember, we, don't, we never vote for president. We vote ever. for electors to electoral yeah, college. And even in a presidential primary, we're not electing anybody or nominating anybody. We're nominating delegates to a convention. Yeah, I'm always surprised by the number of people who don't know that. <laughs> that correct. And so just because someone's name's on the ballot, because it says the electors for president, not... Uh, the president is a unique I, I office, know. right? It I mean, is. Every other office, governor, mayor, we're voting for the person I, on the ballot. I know, but I tell people, go look at your tax bill and, and look at your property tax. If you have a property tax bill, look at your property tax bill. Where's your money going? We're sitting here at GRCC. GRCC is a large portion of... Kent County's tax bill. You should pay attention to who are the GRCC things or GRPS or whatever your local school board is. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a major portion of your property tax bill is for education. And so, and people are so locked in on president or governor and we have 
all these other legislative and county offices. And once again, a lot of people just vote for president and they go, go you know, skip all the way down. Now, once in a while, there's a proposal that gets people excited. So in 2018, we talked about Proposal 3, which changed all these elections. Mm -hmm. And then we had Proposal 2 that um, gave us this independent redistricting commission that's meeting right now, trying to draw these new lines, new congressional and, and um, legislative lines. But do you remember what Proposal 1 was? I do not remember. Legal weed in Michigan. I do remember that. Yes, now. so legal marijuana. So what was the big turnout thing? It wasn't governor in 2018. It was proposal one. It was it was marijuana to legalize marijuana? Legalize marijuana. That was the that was a big draw. That was a huge draw. We I have anecd I don't know numbers. I didn't look at to see, mm -hmm. but usually you have a very big drop off from governor all the way down. This is the only time where you saw a someone. We I have anecdotal in, from from election workers who said people came in and said, "How do I vote for weed?" <laughs> so they wanted. So that was. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't have any data. Right. We, we can't we can't do a null hypothesis on you know and look at the statistical deviations on that. However, from anecdotal evidence, so sometimes proposals drain. What we also saw after the 2016 election, because in 2016 we actually had a recount. So if you remember, after the election, the Green Party asked for a recount of the 2016 presidential election. Oh yeah, and it got stopped halfway through because they're like the everybody's like this this has this has no. No it might, have, it might have cost Hillary Clinton, um, or was was thought that it might have cost Hillary. It might, Clinton and they're finding out the numbers weren't changing. Right. So, so because we have paper ballots that back up what the tabulators did, mm. and in, in 2020, no one had asked for a recount in the state of Michigan. The, okay. We had no, there was no request in the time frame needed. The the Trump campaign or the Republican Party never asked for a recount. We're short on time. Yep. Can you review the? Uh, were we at four or five? Uh, security oh, that was about measures? four. That was uh, that was four. So would you care to review? Yeah. yeah each? So so we have a qualified voter file. So we have a statewide voter list to make sure that people aren't registered in various other places. Um, we I think we talked about signatures. We're matching with that qualified voter file. Um, we're doing pre accurate. We're doing accuracy tests. We have paper ballots. Um, and then oh, we talked about the. I was talking about the canvas. That's where we secure after the election. And then we have post election audits where we go through and then we do a hand count of just um, a random amount of um, precincts and, and random ballots to make sure that the st statistically the ballot, that, that count matches. Hmm. So those are all the different things that we have for, um, for security. Yeah. And, and training, training for election workers and training for election officials, that we're always um, continual learners and making sure that we're all up in the know of what we're supposed to do. So, yeah, so probably uh, with all of these backups that we have now versus maybe 100 years ago, our elections are probably more secure now than they've been. I would hope so. In, the, in, the, in this election fraud, as you know, isn't, isn't new. I mean, and campaigns aren't any nastier than they were back in 1800. Well, it's the nature of conspiracy <laughs> theorists, right? You're right. not gonna convince anybody with the facts or, or, or anything else. Uh, they'll always believe what they're gonna believe, but, um, I'm glad that you came in today and told us yeah. about how elections actually work. I very much appreciate it. I think our audience appreciates it. And, um, and if anybody ever has any questions, you can go to Grand Rapids website and you can apply to be an election worker. That be You can be the first uh, line of democracy then. There you go, thanks for that plug. All right, <laughs> thank you, Joel. And thank you for watching.